you can go missing in the forest. It's something that's just kind of accepted that forests are places where things become lost. Missing. 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 Missing hiker. There is a dark and tangled history that grows in the shadow of the woods, weaving through myth and legend, through stories we've told and warnings we've whispered into the night. The forest is the void of the unknown, a ravenous mouth that picks clean the bones of trespassers. Because the forest has a stomach, and that stomach has never been full. What are we doing out here? We're walking home. Greg, I think we're lost. It isn't immediately apparent that the animated series Over the Garden Wall contains perhaps the darkest forest in fiction. The setup of two people lost in the woods is hardly unfamiliar. In fact, Over the Garden Wall feels manifested from our collective understanding of what a forest is, bright and whimsical in the morning sunlight and then past a certain point, changing into something grim and unknowable, a force conspiring to swallow you whole. More than nearly any other forest, there is a digestive quality to these woods, a growing certainty that anyone trapped too long will disappear forever. What makes a forest feel corrosive? Years ago, I remember reading about the Bennington Triangle, a wooded area of the northeastern U.S. where between 1945 and 1950, five people simply vanished. I saw my local forest differently after that, unable to help but imagine myself being absorbed into the trees, because only one body in the Bennington Triangle was ever recovered, despite some 300 people joining the search. It was only three miles from the forest's edge. It took a year to find. The thing about trees is that they move, not at the dramatic speeds of fairy tales, but watch any time lapse of root growth and you'll see they are animate in a very real sense. Tree networks also conspire, passing along information about potential food sources through fungal links we're just beginning to comprehend. These sorts of revelations bring to mind somewhat pulpy images of carnivorous plants ready to chew with gnashing teeth. In reality, forests don't have teeth, but depending on temperature, a forest network can cooperate to break a body down to a skeleton in a matter of weeks. You can see why so many legends portray trees as scraping, grasping things, waiting to consume those who do not tread carefully. You can see why, across folktales, only the foolish would make a forest angry. The trees are strong, my lord. Rip them all down. When writing Lord of the Rings, Tolkien did not imagine the forest gentle. Breathtaking at times, filled with ancient righteous fury at others, but never gentle, never unmoored from the wild. The forests of Hayao Miyazaki's Princess Mononoke are much the same, untamed, unknowable, unwelcoming to those who wish them harm. Both become stories of violent clashes between nature and industry, of scars that fester into rage and resentment. Though less fantastical, real tree networks do communicate danger and potentially even remember injury, processing information on a slow time scale, but processing it nonetheless. The forests of these stories recall an era before the wounds, and though you may seek shelter among their trunks, the woods are under no obligation to welcome you. What went we out into this wilderness to find? The Puritan family of the film The Witch assumes the forest will provide for them. Yet even before the titular supernatural elements appear, the woods feel distinctly unhospitable. Perhaps not visibly angry like the groves of Miyazaki or Tolkien, but no less apathetic to these new arrivals. Even without something waiting in the dark, there's a sense this family will not survive. But there is something waiting in the dark. If a forest was haunted in European folklore, chances are it was haunted by one archetype in particular. The witches of the film are, notably, archetypal, in many ways embodiments of the family's fear and paranoia carried with them across the Atlantic. 
Puritans saw witches as interlaced with the vast canvas of the North American woodlands. There's a reason why Over the Garden Wall, a story largely woven from early New England storytelling, features them so heavily. Over the centuries, witches have become inexorably tied to the long shadows of the forest, feverish manifestations of the woods' imagined danger. It's peculiar, then, that perhaps the most iconic reimagining of the spooky witch in the American Woods tale never shows you a witch at all. The movie The Blair Witch Project seems to posit that the menace of a forest comes from suggestion, that finding a scrap of clothing from someone dragged off by a witch is scarier than finding a body. It's a persuasive argument. What stuck with me the most about the Bennington Triangle disappearances are the few things the forest left behind. A single rifle cartridge in the dirt, luggage still lying on a bus rack. Uncertainty breeds anxiety. I think that's why sequels and spin-offs to Blair Witch aren't as effective. They can't help but show the monster, because surely that's scarier than an empty forest. In the same way, the family and the witch descends into paranoia from but fleeting sightings of the supernatural. The original Blair Witch works because it's a reminder the woods can terrify, regardless of how often you can actually glimpse something in the shadows. In fact, it is likely because of their obscured nature that woodlands have generated so many tales of monsters. In much the same way the deep ocean makes it easy to imagine leviathans below the surface, it's hard not to feel that anything might dwell far enough within the dim recesses of the woods. But for all the terror they've conjured, there's also something vital that abyssal forests offer the psyche. To watch a time-lapse of old-growth forest decline in the U.S. is to feel a real sense of loss. Learning how these once mythic spaces were cut down to shadows of their former selves. I think of the giant sequoias on the west coast. Trees that seem right out of an enchanted fable, rivaling the heights of what you'd see in a Miyazaki film, now critically endangered. As the forest has declined, so too has the world's wildness, author Robert McFarlane writes, noting how many foundational legends relied upon the forests. Earth's now diminished wildwoods offered a birthplace of monstrous superstitions, but also a kind of storybook bewilderment, and it's impossible not to mourn that, even if what remains is still capable of swallowing the mind. There's hardly a lack of fairy tale forests across the Legend of Zelda series. Little sense that the enchanted groves have been drastically cut back, and yet there is one glade in particular that feels more ancient, more mystical, like a remnant of some unknowable age. The Lost Woods is an unmapped labyrinth of false paths and unnerving entities whose mist-shrouded interior can both astonish and quickly devour you. One of the Glen's most intriguing incarnations is in Breath of the Wild, as that game's freedom of movement means you can enter the woods from any direction. One should therefore be able to tell where the ordinary forest ends and the other begins, the precise point at which you've entered a fable where trees contort into faces in the flickering torchlight. Yet while playing, I found myself struggling to parse that liminality, to know when straying from the path would mean dissolving away. If you speak to those who live on the forest's edge, you can feel how they live with an ever-present worry that they too might inadvertently cross from the known world into the unknown. The margins of the Dark Forest in the Alan Wake games are similarly indefinite, though they blur across a more abstract kind of threshold, the borderline between reality and fiction. In both games, Stephen King analog Alan Wake is a horror writer whose manuscripts inexplicably feed and shape the dark forests of Bright Falls, Washington. These woods feel metafictional in more ways than one, the very space molded of familiar genre tropes. The abandoned shack, the cult in the dark, the killer in the deer mask. In the same manner as Over the Garden Wall, the environment is a modern reader's idea of a forest, wearing its metatextual influences on its sleeve. Never seen so many trees in my life. In many respects, Alan Wake is set in a forest because it had to be set in a forest, because there's always a forest, always a perimeter, that once you've crossed, there is no going back. When trying to map the liminal quality of a forest's horror, I find myself drawn to the language of aviation. 
A PONR, or point of no return, is a term for the moment in which an aircraft no longer has the fuel required to return safely. It's a terrifying thought, and one I've experienced even while exploring virtual forests. Sometimes in games not classified as horror, there have been moments where I felt a panic creep in as I realized I didn't know the way back. Though the in-game map will almost always lead you to safety, it's shocking how strong your animal instinct can be when trapped amid unfamiliar trees. One of the most unexpectedly harrowing examples of passing a forest's point of no return comes from The Sopranos, of all things. Late into the third season, two mobsters confidently venture out into the New Jersey Pine Barrens to dispose of a body, not realizing how lost they become until, predictably, far too late. What follows is a kind of rapid devolving, the two criminals falling apart as a lifetime of experiences in an urban environment prove utterly useless against the simple reality of the wilderness. It feels like a testament to the enduring power of nature that a realistic, city-based crime show had a spooky forest episode, and it works. Because while genres and mediums shift, the fear of wandering too deep into the woods has never left us. Indeed, forests have continued to loom in our minds even as we dream of the stars, towering above the far-flung planets of science fiction. The most common shorthand we have to portray an alien world as unmapped is to cover it with a crop of suspiciously Earth-like trees. As sequestered islands in the cosmos, distant planets naturally coincide with our notions of backwoods inaccessibility, offering the perfect staging ground for tales of sylvan isolation for our heroes to crash land into. On a literal level, the game The Forest doesn't take place on an alien planet. But it might as well, because once your plane plummets into the impossibly isolated landmass, there is no liminal buffer, no safe zone to escape to. The entire map is past the point of no return, with no walls between you and what stalks in the woods. Because the Blair Witch Project this is not, there are capital M monsters in the forest, twisted amalgams of body parts that blend into the branches, and I swear, even though both games in the franchise are fairly popular, I completely missed this was a monster-centric series, so you can imagine my shock when I realized my task was not just to survive alone in the woods. However, as a survival game, The Forest is not purely the experience of being helpless in the backcountry either. Like most works in its genre, it allows you to carve out a space for yourself, to alter the very landscape to suit your needs. It's an appealing fantasy that one could sculpt the shape of a woodland into something more human-centric. The simplest landmark of our attempts to reshape the wild is the road or path, a line cut through the network of the woods. We associate artificial lines with safety, with folktales urging children to seek them out. Follow the yellow brick road. Making a path was actually one of the first things I tried to do in the forest, only to be confronted with how long it realistically takes to chop down a single trunk. But it was a difficult idea to give up on, the concept that with the right lines and boundaries, I might reshape the volatile unknown into a place of rules and safety. How well restrictions and walls truly protect us is a question that bleeds onto every frame of the Colombian stop-motion film The Wolf House. The setup is familiar. A young girl takes shelter from the big bad wolf in an abandoned cottage. What isn't familiar is that the film is painted a frame at a time onto the walls of the cottage itself, a choice that makes you hyper aware of the harsh divisions between the interior and the woods beyond, and that's before those walls start closing in. The girl is further sequestered from the environment by two fairy tale pigs that call the cottage home and demand she never again venture into the wood. The forest is referenced constantly throughout the film, the girl endlessly reminded of the dangers it holds, and yet like her, we are almost never allowed to see it. What we do see are increasingly hostile rules compounding within the imprisoning walls, to the point where the wolf at the door feels less dangerous than the force domesticity. The disturbing second layer to the wolf house 
is that it's inspired by the real-life cult of Colonia Dignidad, an isolationist colony that enforced near-total environmental seclusion from the dangerous outside world, while internally being rife with violence and abuse. The Wolf House film was written as if it were propaganda produced by said colony, making it a surreal story within a story although the actual text of the film is unmistakably anti-cult in its messaging. Reading between the lines, the supposed parable does not ultimately communicate the dangers of the woods outside, but rather the dangers of being trapped within a system that demands total subservience. At what point do the ravenous depths of a forest become safer than a social contract? In the film Pan's Labyrinth, an illusory glen of unearthly creatures is contrasted with the totalitarian regime of 1940s Spain. The protagonist, a girl who observes both spaces, is apprehensive towards the ominous world of the forest, but over the course of the film, the dictatorial forces prove the more threatening, present menace. The fantastical otherworld may be fearsome and at times legitimately dangerous, but it can't hope to match the consistent cruelty of routine authoritarianism. The green places of Pan's Labyrinth may not be the same sanitized image of nature that certain fairy tales promise. They are wild and potentially voracious, but the film suggests there are complexities to even the darkest woodland. How frightening the digestive potential of a forest feels depends almost entirely on the metaphor you apply to it. Stories depicting the grandeur of the woods often turn to allegories of connectivity, discussing how all things within a forest are connected, even in death. There are legitimate truths behind such metaphors. Pando, Latin for I spread, is the name of the world's largest tree, a quaking aspen that spans over a hundred acres. Though above ground Pando stems resemble separate trunks, below the soil the entire grove is a single 10,000-year-old clonal organism. And depending on your definition, many forests act as similar superorganisms. But a human corpse becoming part of such a network can ironically enough be a somewhat difficult concept to swallow. You may have heard of tree burial pods, egg-shaped coffins that trees grow from while feeding on the body inside. In theory, it is a beautiful method of sprouting life from death. And in practice, I'd understand if someone might struggle with this compostable approach to bereavement. Humans of many cultures have a history of wanting their bodies, their essence, to be preserved, wanting not to feed a forest, but to have the same longevity as a forest itself. When I think of the endurance of trees and the fleetingness of humanity, I think of, don't laugh, the steam gardens of Super Mario Odyssey. Here, a towering forest is tended to by decaying robots, their design resembling the machines of the film Silent Running. Set in the distant future, Silent Running follows the world's last forest as it hurtles in a space station out into the void to live as an ageless reminder of an Earth headed for extinction. The forests of the steam gardens feel similarly eternal, something that will keep growing long after the flesh of humans and metal of machines have decayed away. I think of the lifetimes preserved within the thousand rings of a giant sequoia slab at Arizona State, cut from a tree older than the French Revolution, the Aztec Empire, the fall of Rome. We will be outlasted no matter our method of burial. On a long enough time scale, there is no such thing as a permanent embalming, not for humans. Eventually, the roots will find us. Eventually, there will be nothing left. Surrendering to the incremental hopelessness the woods can instill is the one true monster in Over the Garden Wall, an idea embodied by the beast. A whisper amid the trunks that tells you the forest's grip is inescapable. Over the Garden Wall is a show that does not shy away from death's dogged inevitability that all things will in time become part of the soil. And the beast is the bleakest manifestation of that concept, the true reason I consider this forest so uniquely corrosive. It feels like death itself, a sylvan grim reaper waiting at the end of the fairy tale. That green is what awaits us at the end of life, the color that shall grow upon all our tombs, is the idea that encircles the heart of the film The Green Knight. Based on the Arthurian legend, the narrative presents an all-devouring view of nature, with appropriately digestive woods, 
and the titular night feels like an emissary from said woods, a natural death that comes just the smallest bit early. Even more than the original Gawain fable, the knight resembles an archetypal green man, an ancient symbol of rebirth, though the knight's behavior feels more like that of a taker of souls, the indifference of a forest in the shape of a man. All the same, as in the original myth, Sir Gawain seeks out the figure, traveling across the vast woods, clinging to the hope that there must be something else, some other ending waiting for him than the uncaring acts of nature. And we go along, because surely that can't be how the story ends, surely there must be something more. I think part of why the Bennington Triangle has proven such an enduring mystery is because of that assumption that there must be some other explanation. From cannibals to Bigfoot, people feel there must be some further story behind five individuals going missing from the same patch of forest. Never mind the fact that the patch is poorly defined, but at the very least a few hundred miles, more than enough to swallow a few bodies. But it's disheartening to think there might just be the forest, the same green fairy man waiting to carry us to the other side. What is this? Really all there is? What else ought there be? That the likely death of a system might well be a green one is a concept that's expanded into the way we think about apocalypses. Once upon a time, dusty hellscapes were the default vision for the end of the world, with nary a plant in sight. But lately, I've noticed more and more pieces of post-apocalyptic media depicting distinctly arboreal Armageddons. It may have once seemed far-fetched that civilization might fall, but forests would continue. But trees are exceptionally good at growing up from our buildings, breaking down concrete and brick just as they can human bodies. The creep of the roots will never truly stop. It can only be delayed. I think that's why the ending of Over the Garden Wall is so impactful. Spoilers, watch the show, or rewatch it if you haven't already this fall, because it's worth it to see how after every demonstration of the forest's eternal hunger, every admission of death's inevitability, all the insidious whispers of the beast, the protagonist basically just says, no, the woods can't have me right now. My brother and I are going home. It's such a simple rejection of the expected doom and gloom ending, even if it's steeped in a strange melancholy that the woods will eventually catch up to every character. Over the Garden Wall isn't afraid of acknowledging that death will arrive in due course, but first, you have to live. A time will come when we're all digested by the roots, but that time is not today. Today the woods are blessed with a gentle breeze. Today the creek is babbling sweetly. Today there are hidden things budding just beneath the soil waiting for you. And as always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this entry, please lend your support by liking, subscribing, and hitting the notification icon to stay up to date on all things curious. See you in the next video.